very much and um, assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. So great to be here with you all today to celebrate the launch of the Better Community Business Network's new and very important report, The Hidden Survivors, The Mental Health Struggles of Young British Muslims. And as a frontline A&E doctor and somebody who has the brief for the Labour Party for Mental Health, I can tell you that the timing of this report has never been so important. And I am so proud of the work that has been done and the fact that we are launching it today. And I would love to thank the Better Community Business Network for putting together this report and to everyone who has supported and actually contributed to its research. Even before the pandemic, young people's mental health was in crisis. Coronavirus has only deepened the existing problems that previously existed and providing a vital insight into the experience of young Muslims who have access to mental, he mental health services. This report reminds us very starkly that anyone, regardless of background, can suffer with their mental health. And there really is no one size fits all approach when it comes to support. Nevertheless, as this report emphasizes, as a society, we have to understand the role played by cultural context and intersecting identities. As a proud Polish, Pakistani, British, Muslim, I can tell you, I understand what that is like. And now more than ever, it's important that we acknowledge these things and including religion when understanding and working to support those who are struggling with their mental health. We have a phenomenal lineup of speakers today who are experts in their field, who will be offering reflections on the report and um, explaining a bit about the spheres within which they work. And hopefully at the end of this one and a half hour session, we together will feel buoyed and infused by the findings that we've had in a way that means we can take them forward for some real tangible action. It brings me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Shanaz, who is in fact the author of this report, and she will take us through the findings. Thank you, Shanaz. Shanaz, I think you just need to press the unmute button. There we go. We, we all love technology at the moment. Thank you. Hopefully that's better. I think there is some a little bit of echoing. If everyone can go on mute, that would be marvellous. Hopefully that's better. So, um, there we go. Right, so uh, thank you, Rosanna. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll say a few things about the key findings of the study before mentioning um, some of the limitations uh, and highlighting areas for further research. Because I think I think some uh, an important aspect of this report is that it's it's initiating a conversation that to me seems to have stalled, and I and I hope it's going to revive it in a really important way. Um, I'll say a few things um, in terms of a quick overview, which I think is important to contextualize some of the findings in this research. And I, I start by saying that it's important to bear in mind when reading this report that the study actually predates COVID-19. Um, the survey was conducted in 2019 and the report has been delayed due to the pandemic, but it's worthwhile when reading the analysis to bear in mind that the stresses and factors that impinge on mental health of young Muslims will have been acutely affected by the developments over the past 18 months. And none of that is actually reflected in this report. It wasn't part of the survey design. Nonetheless, I think pre the pre-COVID dating of the analysis has three principal strengths, which I, which I hope come through in the report. Um, the first is that it highlights the mental health issues faced by young Muslims in the absence of the pandemic, giving us insights into what young people were experiencing in what was then their normal pattern of living. Um, and it's important when we when we look at the report and we, we currently consider what it is going to be like to return to normal or to go back to our pre-COVID lives, the way that we, we sort of present that scenario, that we don't displace the problems that are evident from that time. 
That's to say that our new normal must be vastly improved if we are to secure healthier lifestyles for our young people. And the problems that are identified in the report are, I think, a valuable guide for our present and future navigation on what better should look like in the new normal. Uh, secondly, the, um, the levels of stress, anxiety and depression that emerged from the report and the more serious mental health conditions will have shifted significantly since the survey was conducted. And from a data analysis point of view, what the pre-COVID data, uh, what the pre-COVID dating of this survey suggests is that religion or belief is a data category that must be fundamentally integrated into analysis of mental health experiences and difficulties during and post the pandemic. It's a really important thing that we don't lose sight of um, as we grapple with the impact that the pandemic has had on young people in particular. Uh, I think it would be careless to remi be remiss on this point. We know from census and survey data that young people in the UK in general are less religious than older age groups, but this does not hold for all young people. Young Muslims, as this report shows, enjoy a stable and complex relationship with their faith, both in terms of identity and lived experience. And it's important that we recognize these nuances in subgroup analysis to ensure that we're not casually dismissing faith-inspired tools and techniques that can be re that can really support young people when it comes to managing their mental well-being and mental health. We need to be more robust in our engagement with religion and spirituality in the area of mental health, specifically where it relates to Muslim communities. Thirdly, the sample contains a good proportion of service users. Two thirds of the sample responded to the question of whether or not they had experienced any counselling. And of these, almost half said yes. The insights in the study from service users tells us something of their experiences with mental health counselling pre-COVID. Um, and I think it's a useful barometer against which to measure improvements in post-COVID COVID service user experiences, not least in respect of the impact COVID-19 has had on ethnic minority communities. I hope that future work will go on to examine the impact of the pandemic on young people and explore questions of faith and spirituality far more rigorously um, and recognize that it is a data category that renders real value in relation to Muslim subjects. Ignoring or relegating it carries the real risk of jeopardizing the quality of care that young Muslims deserve from mental health services. And I think that's a really important point that's raised from this report. Um, if, I, if I run through very quickly some of the key findings, because I'm hoping a lot more of this will emerge in uh, the panel discussion a little bit later. Um, so there, there is a few things that I would say um, uh, specifically. First is that the report really does show faith as a protective factor. It's borne out in the analysis with the majority of respondents saying that faith plays a positive role in supporting mental well-being, uh, almost two thirds of the sample. Um, and among those who have experienced mental health struggles, the figure is even higher at four in five um, individuals. More than half of young Muslims are likely to turn to faith when experiencing mental health struggles with more, more young Muslim men saying that they're likely to do so, 61%, compared to young Muslim females, which are just over half. For young Muslims who've experienced counseling or therapy, the figures are marginally higher at around two thirds who say that they're likely to turn to faith when experiencing mental health struggles. Um, a second key finding is the strong correlations that emerge in relation to the positive role that faith plays when it comes to mental well-being. In almost all cases, the correlation coefficient approaches one, indicating a very strong positive correlation. Experiencing mental health struggles and a belief that faith has a positive role in supporting mental well-being bears out the strong tendency among young Muslims who view faith as a benign tool um, with an association of R equals 0 0.91. Turning to faith when experiencing mental health struggles and the belief that faith has a positive role to play also has a really strong, significant correlation. For young Muslims who have experienced counseling or therapy, there are also strong associations between being a service user and the importance of attached mental health services being culturally and faith sensitive and believing that faith has a positive role in supporting mental well-being um, and a correlation coefficient there of zero, uh, 0 0.997. I think that's a really important finding 
for the mental health services sector. It's, it's vital that service users and the experiences that they've disclosed in this report is part of the way in which services are responding to their needs and recognising how they utilise faith in their journey to better mental health. Uh, nonetheless, faith is also a, a risk factor, and that's something that also comes across in our report. Uh, there are feelings in relation to guilt, which is a common reason, reason cited by young Muslims for not viewing faith as assisting with mental health struggles, both in terms of self-induced uh, negative sentiment, such as shame or feelings of ingratitude, and externally directed, that is blame or censure, uh, that's um, directed at them um, for expressing guilt or expressing um, uh, difficulties with their mental well-being. And culture masquerading as religion also emerges in the findings. Young people are particularly scathing about attempts to nullify their experiences or diminish them by invoking ill-informed opinions that negate the possibility of Muslims experiencing mental health struggles. Um, I think as Rosanna mentioned, anyone and everyone uh, can suffer mental health struggles. There is no one size fits all. There's no, there's no mold in which people uh, escape uh, difficulties in modern, in modern life. Um, and in relation to faith-based, faith-based faith -based and faith-based interventions, that is locations as well as methods. Um, more than half of young people who have experienced mental health struggles say that they've turned to their friends, uh, followed, followed by their family, when see, all seeking help through therapy, which is around one in five. Um, and nearly one in five said that they turned to no one when undergoing difficulties. I think some of these findings give them indications of where it is that young people are being failed um, when it comes to how they access support or where they turn to when, when um, difficulties emerge. Uh, secondly, in given the qualitative nature of how, how faith helps um, through ritual prayer, through specific prayers, through stories of inspiration that are taken from Islamic history, such as the Prophet Muhammad's Year of Sorrow, or stories of other prophets that are related in the Quran. All of these indicate that young people utilize a repertoire of tools and techniques. Um, and faith-based interventions need to adapt to engage a more sophisticated mental health lexicon that enables young people to access these tools more easily. Um, and lastly, I'll say a bit about sites of support and intervention, because this is another finding that emerges from this report. Helping young people with mental health challenges is a multi-site intervention project. It requires cooperation and collaboration between a variable geometry of sites based on where the issues emerge and where they lead and where they cause an impact. The health sector is, of course, a primary site of intervention, and this relates both to statutory and community service provision, but also important are universities and workplaces. The study shows a clear preference among young Muslims to experience in counselling from a Muslim counsellor. And many reasons are given to explain this preference, such as fears of negative judgment, past bad past experiences, or lack of understanding by someone not familiar with religion or cultural context, and the failure to provide or offer faith appropriate support. How statutory and community services integrate this into work with Muslim service users, I think is vitally important. And I look forward to listening to some of the other panelists who work in mental health services. Um, in relation to some of these findings from the report. Um, lastly, I want to say a few things about the limitations of this study um, and future areas of work, because I do think it opens up a pathway um, for much more work to be done. Firstly, um, a word on gender. Uh, this study is largely about young Muslim women uh, because they form three quarters of the survey sample. Um, and I think more work is definitely needed to examine the mental health issues faced by young Muslim men. Whether targeted research or booster samples and wider surveys, I think all of this is necessary to get, gain much uh, deeper understanding into um, mental health difficulties faced by young Muslim males. Uh, secondly, a point on geography. Uh, so this, this study is London centric, uh, given the concentration of respondents who live in the capital, which was just over half of the sample. Um, we know from other research that living in urban environments can impact on mental health, and we certainly know from ONS analysis in the past year that COVID-19 has been a major factor in community trans transmission when it comes to household type, um, such as overcrowded housing and intergenerational households. And I think it's a useful foray 
for future research on mental health to make better use of geography as a category to delineate variances in mental health struggles faced by young Muslims based on where they live, how they live and with whom they live. Um, and thirdly, on ethnicity. Uh, so this study is principally about South Asian Muslims. They made up three quarters of the sample. Um, and this might be explained by some of the channels that were used to disseminate the survey and the individuals that were involved in the early planning meetings for the conference that was hosted by BCBN. Um, and the survey profile shows that references to cultural, cultural traditions when it comes to impact on mental health takes on a very specific and limited application in this report, given the ethnic makeup of the sample. Uh, the 2001 census, we know that around a quarter of British Muslims were of non-Asian background. But by 2011, this had risen to almost a third. Um, and it will be a few years before we know what the 2020 census tells us about the ethnic makeup and demographic changes in the profile of British Muslim communities. But the need to better understand mental health issues in smaller ethnic subgroups within Muslim communities is vital. And targeted work or boost samples as part of wider survey design would be valuable to draw out more nuanced readings on the role of cultures, plural, when it comes to young Muslims and mental health and well-being, um, I'll pause here um, and look forward to listening to contributions from the other speakers and and to further interventions during the panel discussion. Thank you so very much, uh, Shanaz. There is there is so much there to to, to unpack and. Uh, Thank you very much also for, you know, for your honesty in uh, describing where some of the limitations are, which really can be translated into opportunities for further research. I think some of the things that particularly struck out for me, as we know that young men um, across our whole population, regardless of um, ethnicity or religion, struggle to talk about their mental health. I think it'd be really interesting to be able to go on also and see um, any more specific challenges facing uh, young Muslim men. And, and as you so rightly say, it isn't a one size fits all model and actually conflating culture with religion is a really interesting aspect that I think many of us often don't think about. So thank you for all your absolutely incredible work and to know that there was you know, statistical significance in what you found is really, really heartening. And for those of you who are joining us, friends, thank you, welcome. Um, I am Dr. Rosanna and uh, it is a pleasure to be hosting this today. Thank you and uh, you're absolutely welcome to um, listen to our incredible speakers and then feed into a discussion later on where we will be taking your questions. Next, we have um, a, a, a phenomenal uh, speaker that I'd love to introduce you to called um, Dr. Uh, Ghazal Amir. She is Associate Professor of Health Equity and Inclusion at the University of Leeds and leads the Multidisciplinary uh, Inequalities Research Network and the International Partnerships for Equity and Inclusion. So I would love to, uh, I would love to hand over to Dr. Garza Amir now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and I mean, I've got five minutes to say, to sort of say what we're doing at Leeds and also to respond to the report. So I'll try to pack in as much as I can. What I really, um, what really resonated with me was the um, emphasis on social exclusion and mental health, a sort of association between those two things. We already know from the existing literature that people from Muslim communities are more exposed to stress, stressors such as poverty, unemployment and racism uh, than many other groups within society. And racial discrimination has, from the existing literature, we know already been associated with depression and anxiety in young people. What young Muslim people um, uh, experience on top of uh, the standard racial discrimination to do with, with skin color and, and a different way of life is cultural racism, deeply embedded attitudes uh, towards Islam, negative attitude that, that perceive Islam as backward, inferior, immoral, dangerous. And these are historical attitudes that have been associated with um, justifying colonization and include and at the current time are being used to, to justify current neo-colonial politics. Um, and on top of that, there is the aspect of social inclusion that, that relates to a lack of therapist training to engage with religious identity. Um, and as uh, Shanaz has said, many people from Muslim communities, including young Muslims, turn to faith uh, as an important kind of resource for health when it comes to um, uh, mental, issue, mental health issues. And we found in our research at Leeds that suicide prevention, you know, it was a huge issue to do with 
uh, how people really felt that you know suicide was not allowed within Islam and that was the last thing that actually stopped them from from committing suicide so it's a huge issue but the lack of therapist training affects their confidence to engage with religious values their lack of familiarity with Islamic responses to to mental health issues and it, it creates this potential to replicate the social exclusion that we find within society within healthcare settings and I think we need to introduce, uh, we need to uh, understand this social exclusion in relation to mental health at three different levels, at the political or socioeconomic and what we might call the macro level context, where there's underrepresentation uh, of people from Muslim backgrounds in policy making and in decision making about what support is offered and how these communities should be um, conceptualized and, and engaged with. And these power imbalances contribute to to the lack of representation there and feed into the kind of racism and stereotypes, misconceptions about Muslim communities that are promoted so that you really can't, as a Muslim, you can't get away from it, even within your home, you switch on the TV and there's, uh, it, it's, you know, the chances are that you will come across some kind of racist stereotype about Muslim communities on a regular basis. And this influences how institutions actually treat people from Muslim backgrounds uh, as well. I noticed that we've got people from the Muslim Council of Britain here, their recent report on Islamophobia described what happens to young, young people in the UK as legally sanctioned harassment, that in all areas of public service, we get young people um, actually targeted for their Muslim identity through programs like the Prevent, uh, the Prevent program. And through, um, for example, we saw recently political activism amongst young Muslims on the issue of Israel and uh, oppression of Palestinians was treated as uh, terrorist activity, potential terrorist activity was stamped down on rather than seen as an opportunity to um, engage with Muslim identity and to support young people to take political positions, it was seen as a negative issue. So there's a failure to recognize and meet the needs of young Muslims, uh, leading to barriers in service provision and inequalities in the quality of services that are, that are offered and the outcomes from those services. And this all feeds into what happens within communities and individuals. Um, mistrust and fear of healthcare and other public services, lower capacity to actually deal with, with what is happening, um, lower health literacy, lower, re lower resources within the communities themselves because of reduced social and cultural capital. And this is all a vicious cycle which feeds into, again, the, the macro and the institutional context. So what we've been doing at Leeds is try to undermine those dynamics by adapting, culturally adapting an existing uh, and well-established um, therapy for depression. We already know from the literature that faith sensitive therapies um, can reduce levels of depression much quicker, much more quickly and more effectively within uh, cultural minorities. And within Muslim communities, we, uh, as was mentioned in the report, religion is a key aspect of identity and people from Muslim communities are more likely to use religious coping techniques. What we identified was the use of positive religious coping, which is an internalized um, conceptualization of religion that helps people develop resilience, hope, making sense of their experience and increasing their self-esteem. What we know from this report is that young Muslims need support to draw on this because otherwise negative aspects of religious coping can take over the idea of uh, mental health issues being a punishment, feeling abandoned, feeling guilty, obsessive behavior. So people actually need support from others to draw on positive religious coping. And what we found was that there are so many Islamic teachings that reinforce what therapists are trying to do. The idea that um, you know, being active is helpful. Is There are so many Islamic teachings that sort of support that to, um, to, to not stigmatize this kind of um, issue, health issue, to think positively about yourself. There's so many kind of Islamic teachings that can be used in ways that actually motivate people more than perhaps just saying that without reference to this valued uh, framework that, that uh, people from Muslim backgrounds often rely on. So I think in terms of addressing the dynamics I've, I've talked about at the macro or socioeconomic and political level, we need to incorporate community understandings of religion and of its value and to legitimize and value Muslim identity. At the institutional level, we need to promote the knowledge that's needed to engage effectively to equip staff to support Muslim serve, young Muslim service users, to counter the racist practice that's there, to reduce the, the discretion that's available for people to, uh, to take advantage of institutional discrimination. And all that will help to increase trust in the support that's offered so that more people will actually turn to healthcare provision and they would be less fearful of discriminatory treatment. Thank you. 
thank you so much, you know, Dr. Mir. Uh, there are so many layers there. I feel like I have a million questions that I would, <laughs> I would like to ask you myself. Um, but what is really stark is that, you know, understanding the um, inequalities that drive mental ill health in the first place alongside um, institutionalized racism and Islamophobia, alongside looking at how we can use religious teachings uh, to heal people. That is, it's, it's also fascinating. Thank you very, very much. Um, we are also lucky to be joined here today by Brian Dow, the, the Deputy Chief, Chief Executive of Rethink Mental Illness. I have had the honour of working with Rethink Mental Illness and he's also the Chief Executive of Mental Health UK, a coalition of four mental health charities across the UK. Brian. Thanks very much, Rosanna. And just to say, I, it's just an absolute privilege to be um, at this report. And I mean that quite sincerely. And I'll say why in a second. And thank you to Saba and the team um, and Shanaz for the report and those really um, valuable comments that Dr. Mir has just made. Um, I mean, the reason I'm so pleased to be here is because um, I mean, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? The, the, the report uses the word hidden in it, and it's, it's an excellent uh, report. But I suppose in a sense, something is only hidden if you're not paying attention. And people often talk about mental illness being invisible, but it's only invisible if, if you're not looking. And I think the kind of obligation uh, for people that do roles like me in society uh, as a whole to listen to this really critical message that's being delivered today is, is so important, particularly in a year where we've gone through you know, we all, everyone right across the world has gone through the most extraordinary experience. And I think in terms of the pandemic, people often talk about the kind of physical effect. And of course, with a, with a virus that pose, poses such risk to, to life, there is a huge physical threat. There's also a big mental health um, dimension to the, to the pandemic. And I don't know anybody that hasn't gone through the last year who hasn't experienced some impact on their mental health as a result of the isolation or the grief or the worry about their job or financial worries. So, so there's been a big change in that front. And of course, I think as um, someone indicated earlier on, I think the issue of race has also um, gone through a paradigm shift and clearly needs to um, because of the kind of deep systemic racism that people face. Um, and again, the, the contributors thus far have talked about very eloquently. So I thought what I might do really in the, in, the, in the kind of short time that I've got is just make a couple of um, reflections on uh, the, the report itself. Maybe talk about a bit where Rethink uh, itself is, is kind of coming at things from and how some of the changes that are happening out there in the public domain, I think, offer an opportunity to, to, to grip this agenda and to make the kind of change that I think it's, uh, the report eloquently sets out that we need to make. So, so, so firstly, just in terms of Rethink, um, very quickly, I mean, Rethink's been a campaigning organisation for about 50 years, but it's also run services right across England on a variety of different fronts for the last, I think, 30 or so, certainly a lot, a lot longer than I've uh, been there. Um, so we are a big service provider, but to some extent, I think one of the things that happened, particularly over the last 10 years or so during that period of austerity, is that we found ourselves very much at the mercy of commissioners. And in particular, commissioners in, uh, in, in local councils who, as we all know, have had their budgets very severely cut, you find yourself trying to do more for less. Um, and, you know, co colleagues, I'm, I'm looking at Vanessa, I'm sure she'll be familiar with this um, situation, that it becomes really difficult to run commission services. And I think that's um, brought us to a point we've reached recently, which again, I'll describe in a second or two, um, that actually we have to do things differently. Relying on hard-pressed councils um, to run commission services that don't meet the needs of people in their community, that are have huge blind spots, that mean that people are not accessing services and they're certainly not accessing culturally appropriate services or services that put faith um, at the centre of them, I think is a very big problem. But we have an opportunity, as I say, I think, to change that. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think... Separate to all of that, um, there's, there's a big question, I think, that exists about where and who mental health affects. And, and I think I think Dr. Muir talked about it there uh, earlier on, as did Shanaz. I, I think the reality that mental illness doesn't 
discriminate and who it affects, but the very different and sometimes very racialized experiences that people have because of the um, cultural background and the society in which we uh, exist means that some of the recommendations uh, arising from the report, I think, have to be seen as at the test of what a good health system looks like. So ju just to make a couple of remarks about the um, report itself, I mean, I just want to say firstly that I really think that that is um, a kind of central proposition that there's a deficit of consideration of faith in policy making is, is, is absolutely right. And the extent to which that plays through in the lack of provision um, of services, uh, services that are not appropriate for people and therefore you know, services that people don't access because they're not really designed to support people is, is, a re is a really serious deficit in the health system. And I was very struck by those fig figures that people are, I mean, my maths isn't quite accurate here, but you know, three times more likely to, to look for support from friends than they are accessing, accessing services. And I think if I've got the figures correct, roughly the same number of people uh, don't get any kind of help to who receive therapy and that's a pretty searing indictment i think on the, on the gap that's that's out there um the, i think the second thing that really jumped out at me was was that notion of of people seeking greater control uh, over over their um the, the services that they, they receive and obviously in the sense that this isn't just about the healthcare system because again one of the things that we think um has has really campaigned on is the notion of a social model of mental health yes of course, the care that you receive and the quality of that and how close to home it is and how culturally and faith appropriate is, is important. But lots of other factors impinge on the course of your mental health, your financial situation, um, how uh, integrated you might be in your given community. Um, the, uh, do you have a, a, a kind of a good job? Are you, um, you know, do you have a stable and safe home? All those other things affect people to a lesser or greater extent. And I think in terms of the opportunity to change, just to come on to kind of a couple of final couple, uh, comments, I, 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 I guess I'd slightly characterize these as th three Ps. So, so the first P is place. Um, I'm sure that people will know that there's a, there's a, there's a significant change going in, on in the health and social care system. And I'm looking at Rosanna and cl clearly not quickly enough. And, We've got a big issue to tackle in social care. But the integration of health systems and social care systems, with a big caveat that we need to properly reform the latter and invest in it, is, is actually a good thing because I think it op offers an opportunity to work in a different way and to recognise that those other factors, including having faith appropriate services that recognise people's individual circumstances, it has a much better prospect of happening now than in a top-down health system. Uh, I think the second thing is just the, the notion of principle. And, and Rethink has been doing a, a lot of work initially in Somerset, but we're now beginning to roll that out in places including East London, where we are trying to build alliances that really truly reflect the local communities, the, the individual needs that people have in their community and don't just you know, provide services for, I don't want to say the usual suspects, but you know, continue to have those huge blind spots. And I think the principle that, that sits behind that is one of generous leadership. Rethink, like a number of kind of big organisations, uh, does have a lot of resources, but I think we need to listen. We need to be shaped by the experiences of people uh, on, on the ground. And that very much building a bottom-up ecosystem that supports people, I think, is is the crit critical uh, factor. And then the last is partnership. I really can't emphasize this enough. Uh, a, a time when I think organizations like ourselves are having a pretty big consideration of the way that we've gone about doing things. To what extent have we been complicit in delivering those services um, and accepting a, a kind of race to the bottom? I think the notion of partnership and being shaped by the experiences of people who are embedded in their communities, who understand the experience of people that they're representing and supporting is absolutely critical. And I think that that partnership principle um, is the most likely way to go about addressing some of those important recommendations that are set out in the report. So I'm looking forward to kind of the, 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 kind of the, the debate that 
follows on from this and um, thanks again very much for inviting me. Thank you so much, uh, Brian, and I can honestly tell you from having worked with Rethink Mental Illness, uh, you have a champion in Brian when it comes to prioritising people and their mental health, regardless of which community that they come from. So it is fantastic that, that you've been able to join us today, Brian. Thank you so much. And uh, we're now going to come on to our next speaker, Catherine Roche. Catherine is the chief executive of the fantastic children and young people's mental health charity called Place to Be. I have had the privilege of working very closely with Place to Be and with Catherine and look forward to hearing from her. Thank you, Catherine. Great, thank you, Rosina. And thank you, Saba and Shanaz and everybody for inviting, for inviting me this afternoon or this morning um, and being part of the launch of the report. Um, so Place to Be is a charity focused on providing school-based mental health services and Brian mentioned the importance of partnership and local communities. And our work is absolutely about working hand in hand in partnership embedded within schools, um, whether that is primary schools or secondary schools. And I know the focus of the report was more on young people, um, but in terms of getting in early and addressing mental health problems and promoting positive mental health, we know this can be so effective when we do this right from an early age and get in early when children are, are really young. Um, so we, have, we're, we work in schools right around the country. Our teams are embedded in around 400 schools. Um, and I think one of the things to highlight is our work is, is very much with a, with a very diverse population. Um, and more with a great diversity, more diverse than the UK population on average. Um, we work in communities where there's significant deprivation and social challenges. And I think that's also a, a further overlay in terms of the complexity of addressing mental health issues. And so many of the schools use pupil premium funding in order to be able to access the support. But the important piece is being based within the school we know that we can reach children and families without stigma. And the report highlights the level of stigma associated with mental health, whether, and, and we know that's the case in, in general, but, in, but even more so you've highlighted when it comes to Muslim families, Muslim children and a population. But by being based in the school and normalizing mental health um, services and being able to promote positive mental health and well-being, we know we can address that stigma and that, that challenge. Um, and within place to be schools, around a third of children, whether that's from the little teeny tinies right through to the, in the older age groups, around a third of children will access and reach out and look for support and access mental health provision from one of our counsellors. So we run a weekly drop-in service and children do access, that, um, do access that readily. So I think the importance of getting in and normalising um, mental health support in the everyday environment is so important. Um, it's also about working um, and having a mental health professional who can work with uh, and reach out to parents and work with the, the parents whether that's mom or dad, and also work with the staff in the school to help them recognize not just somebody who might be acting out, you know, and often that's, you know, the boys are identified as the children who may be acting out, but also the quieter, more withdrawn and shy children um, who may otherwise go unnoticed, regardless of, of culture, of faith. It's a class teacher who is alert to that and who can spot a change or, or something that's, that's different. Um, in terms of our service, uh, we do not gather data by faith. And I think that is an area that you've highlighted within the report. We do gather data which looks at ethnicity. Um, and broadly, we, we can identify that Asian, Asian British children um, are more underrepresented within our service than other ethnicities and cultures. So there is definitely something here, culture, I recognize that I'm speaking culturally rather than specifically about faith, but there's an, um, there's an overlay there um, also. 
and there is more to do. And that's when, when we come down then within to our individual school communities and population, we can see that in some of those, we have some schools where children will readily access and reach out. And then they're, and they are overrepresented in Asian, Asian British, um, whereas in some local schools, they are underrepresented. So we really need to get down into that local school level to try and understand where there are pockets of really great practice and what we can do. And whether that is about the, the, the counselor or the professional being of the same faith or culture or ethnicity um, as the population within the school or what are the factors that we can identify. So as a service provider, this is something that is um, hugely important to do. And if I come on to the workforce, um, again, the report highlights the importance of the workforce reflecting and representing the communities that we support. And I think there's a lot of work for us to do in the mental health sector on the workforce generally, in terms of reaching children and young people and equipping professionals with the skills um, to, to work therapeutically with children and young people. But there's even more to do when it comes to ensuring we have a representative workforce. Um, within the counselling profession, uh, we, we recognise it is predominantly white, female, middle class. And I think this is something where we need to find routes to encourage people from a wider range of cultures, faiths and ethnicity to come into the workforce. Within Place to Be, we have brought together a coalition of, um, of uh, training bodies to actually look at this and to look at how we can open up the counselling training uh, and encourage people from a wider range of ethnicities into the workforce. We've established a bursary scheme, which is just the teeny tiny beginnings of that. But it's more importantly, it's also having um, uh, culturally sensitive content and an understanding from the tutors and built into the programs that we are that we are training. Um, I think also an area as a service provider and for all of our staff having access to faith and culturally sensitive resources that we can use. This is also an area which uh, from which we will all benefit greatly. I'm conscious good thinking has, has recently um, produced a guide, five ways to good mental well-being and Islam. It's a, it's a start. And I think there's much more that, uh, that all of us could use and leverage in our services um, with more re resources. So I think we're, we're at the start really of a conversation as a service provider and really welcome the report in terms of helping to put a spotlight as we all progress on this journey. So thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I think it is so important, isn't it, particularly for our young people from all Muslim communities, whether they be black, Asian, Caucasian, that they are speaking to people who they feel understand where they're coming from. And so I think the importance of growing the workforce to reflect the wider community is so important. And thank you really very much for also um, acknowledging that in your comments. Um, thank you. So our last speaker is Vanessa Morris. Uh, it brings me great pleasure to introduce Vanessa, who is the Chief Executive of Mind in the City um, in uh, Hackney, Waltham Forest, and she's also worked to support the mental health of diverse communities in London for the last 20 years. So she is a wealth of knowledge. Vanessa, welcome. Thank you very much and my huge congratulations to everyone involved in this very, very comprehensive report. A little bit about us. We work with about 5,000 people every year across the City of London, Hackney and Waltham Forest. We specialise in psychological therapies and workplace wellbeing. We have about 50 grassroots partners, um, including 16 as part of our City in Hackney Wellbeing Network, which is a, a network of culturally specific and mental health focused providers. We also host Irie Mind and Rainbow Mind, which are specific programs to improve the mental health of people from African Caribbean communities and also the LGBT plus community. And we're part of the Mind Federation, which is a network of 100 different local providers and also national mind. 
Um, getting lost means that sometimes you end up covering what other people have said, and I'm going to do that now. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to highlight from the report is the issue around visibility and the importance of being able to record faith as it comes to people in services, because if we can't record, we can't benchmark, and we can't understand how well we are doing collectively in terms of equity of access, outcome, and experience. We've been involved in a program with the Government Equalities Unit, specifically rating to LGBT plus people who have had similar issues in terms of showing up in services. And I think we need to explore something here collectively to be able to have a systematic approach, being able to understand, record access for faith. The part of the Hidden Survivors Report that's a call to action for me is the strong message that Muslims find faith protective of their mental health and there's a wish to be represented in the support that they receive and that having someone who shares faith in connection and support is very important to us. So that requires confidence and competence from practitioners, both supporting the wider workforce to connect what it is in Islamic faith that can be supportive of, of mental health but also um, supporting and tailoring therapeutic interventions. And I think that there's some great examples of that, for example, through Islamic psychology and beha applied behavioral activation, which I think Ghazala has been involved in developing and um, evaluating. So this means this, that we support the development of Muslim mental health practitioners, as Catherine just said, um, becoming a therapist is an expensive, and long journey and often is dominated by the white middle class. So Muslim practitioners both need support, including financial support, but also a sense of safety as they develop their practice, but also for supporting and training our younger and more diverse workforce through um, positive action and through providing a range of career pathways that enable people to feel like they've got a trajectory, but they've also something tangible that they can offer now. I also want to speak about intersection. I think whilst it's important that faith leaders feel confident and capable to support mental health, it's also important that people from Muslim backgrounds feel like they are able to gain support through services where they might find challenges of being accepted and heard. For example, for ensuring that women's services or LGBT plus services feel confident in addressing needs that come from different parts of ourselves and equipping non-mental health organisations to understand the intersection of their work with mental health. Our Rainbow Mind program is an example of this in practice. It's a transdiagnostic therapeutic program addressing the mental health challenges that come from being LGBT plus when you're also minoritized by your faith or ethnicity. We run this program through pathways with LGBT plus charities, like for example, UK Black Pride, but also grassroots faith-based organizations. During COVID, we've extended and boosted this program because we got very quick feedback from young, um, Muslims and, and other faith-based communities of people of colour that they felt very uncomfortable and concerned about their mental health but also their safety during lockdown. I think it's also important that the NHS reconsiders what good looks like, and this comes back to what Brian was saying, and to aim to develop cultural humility. Often mainstream services are commissioned on the basis of the lowest common denominator or on therapies that have institutional advantages and in becoming endorsed as safe or effective. We know that Muslims have lower levels of access and worse outcomes from IAP services. We're really fortunate in City and Hackney within improving access to psychological therapies that we use a, an alliance format. And through that, we have commissioned services that are both delivered and developed by specific communities. So for us, we deliver an African Caribbean focused uh, IAP service, but we also work in partnership with providers, for example, an Orthodox Jewish charity. Um, and we get some of the best outcomes in the country. And it would be fantastic to see that kind of approach that really sort of builds therapies from the ground upwards across the whole country. The last few years haven't been kind to faith and culturally specific charities, and there's been a lot of black ground loss to austerity. And many of the solutions in the report have already been tried by practitioners often working in small groups, tightest of budgets and is sparse and sometimes in different landscape. Local minds like ours have got a key role to play. For example, through the practitioner development I've just described, and through supporting and being kind of a bridge through pathways through faith-based communities and commissioned mental health services. 
Local minds are also nimble enough to support local piloting and blueprinting of best practice. Development of cultural advocacy within Mental Health Act reform is really important, but I think that the NHS understanding that inequality is a public and population health issue and building on the great work of local areas, commissioning Muslim specific outreach and anti-stigma work across the whole country. And here I want to highlight the Haiyan project, which has been part of Mind in Harrow for the nearly 15 years as a great example of community led initiative that builds mental health literacy, reduces stigma, builds peer support and cultural competency to support the Somalia community across Northwest London. We see a role for a Muslim mind a network or web of a collab that builds a collaborative or faith-based mental health providers to highlight, advocate and support the mental health needs of Muslim communities. Such a network could enable a broad platform that campaigns on mental health equity. We need to act both for immediate needs, but also to plan for the long term, both to develop the workforce and the evidence base for therapeutic approaches, but also understand that the effects of racism migration and trauma are long-term and intergenerational, and the next generation of Muslims will need and rightly demand support. I've got a quote here from a client of ours. Faith prevents me from crossing the red line between thoughts into action, because I believe that my faith sees suicide as a sin, a greater sin than anything that I'm currently going or through or doing. Having a Muslim therapist at mind means that I have someone who feels understands me, and can explore in-depth thoughts in relation to my faith, knowing that I don't have to explain concepts or anything that I'm talking about. I also find that my therapist will bring in relevant teachings about my faith that helps me to reflect upon my viewpoint and gain other perspectives than the narrow and fearful one I currently find myself stuck in. We're working very proudly with BCBN to arrange a community conversation to focus on how we can put our resources together to build more effective pathways and support some welcome discussion with all partners here. Our vision is of a Muslim mind network where we celebrate the role of faith and culture play in good mental health. And rather than it being a source of shame or discrimination, in spite of the challenges, we think there's good reasons for hope. And there's so many brave, creative and hugely talented mental, Muslim mental health practitioners here on the call. And that gives me confidence and hope. Thank you so much, Vanessa. And to end uh, the, uh, the official contributions on that note of hope is just simply wonderful. Thank you. And uh, I would like to open uh, the panel floor now to discussion. And um, as, as a Muslim woman, it was gratifying to read this report and learn that 59% of respondents say that faith plays a positive role in supporting their mental health and well-being. And myself personally, having very recently gone through a bereavement, I know that, you know, that having my faith made a very, very dark time that much more well, that much less lonely, really. The um, community were really there for me so far that actually my mum, who's not a Muslim, said it made her actually think about becoming a Muslim because she saw um, the, the strength that can come from faith and having a community around you in very dark times. And I thought I would share that personal point because I found that actually very beautiful. Um, but highlighted in the report, unfortunately, faith can also act as a risk factor both from self-induced feelings of guilt, and I know Vanessa you know, touched on that, you know, people, you know, people who shy away from, from suicide because of feeling guilty that it is a sin, rather than you know, looking at, hold on a minute, what can I do to accept how I feel and work to feel better? Um, and also shame for seeking help and external factors, such as Islamophobia and, and institutional racism, potentially aggravating the mental health challenges faced by young Muslims. So, to this end, I'd like to open it up to all panelists really, to first ask how can we ensure um, authentic engagement and representation within the Muslim community that challenge unconscious bias? And how do you think we can best support further outreach and engagement with faith communities? And in turn, how can faith communities help facilitate and enhance these efforts? So lots there to unpick. Um, I'm very happy um, you know, to start with anyone that wants to raise their hand and give it a go. Oh, I, I see Vanessa. Yes, Vanessa, if you can unmute, that'd be brilliant. Great. Well, I think I can see in, in the, the chat bar, there's just so many 
fantastic examples of faith-based organizations and also faith-based mental health organizations who are doing exactly this. And we need to make sure they're funded. We need to have some kind of quite significant policy and commissioning levers to ensure that they can continue to do their work and they are platformed and supported to do that work. It's also, you know, it's very painstaking and long-term work and we need to work together to have develop toolkits to make it's things as simple as possible, but also to provide the space. So where it is more challenging and outreach takes time to build up trust, that we are doing so and not assuming that because something hasn't worked the first time, that it won't work eventually. Mm. Thank you. Dr. Mayor, please. Yeah, sorry, I don't know how to raise my hand. But, uh, yeah, I think, I think the idea of authentic representation is really important because this is not just about employing Muslims or engaging with Muslims, but actually in, employing and engaging with Muslims who have connections to their to, to Muslim communities that are well connected within their communities and that can not just uh, bring the views of those communities to discussions, but also feedback and make sure that I think what, what's really important is that we see what, what Brian was talking about earlier, leadership plus partnership together. That yes, we do need generous leadership in, in the end, in the sense that we need to share power. And I, as an academic, also have to take that decision to, to not replicate exclusion within the research process, to actually share power with those who are involved in the research, which I could so easily withhold as somebody who's got, who's got that power. So it is about generous le leadership, but it's also about making yourself accountable so that it's strong partnership. It's not just partnership with people who you can sort of consult with and then go away and do whatever you feel like, but actually they will hold you accountable and you allow and you put them in a position where you are accountable to them. Um, and just the other thing to say about engaging with, with Muslim-led organizations, um, it's great to do that. One of the problems I see from the history of how this has happened is that they're often on insecure funding with um, very, uh, you know, sort of uh, tight budgets, as, as Vanessa mentioned, we need to see the link between those organizations and mainstream services, so that people working within those organizations have clear career pathways within mainstream services, what they're doing feeds into mainstream services, it's not about absolving mainstream providers of responsibility, it's about actually supporting them to do their job better. Um, so I think it's really important that we have that, um, we have that kind of, uh, not, we have that kind of relationship but and it's not just local projects because local NHS or local authority projects means that you're subject to a postcode lottery this this is strategy we need strategy at a national level yeah thank you I think that's very important your point about about strategy at a national level comes down to political will and I think this report really highlights that we really can't can't wait we have to get this right now because there are whole communities that are relying on, on us to take these um, you know, findings forward and actually turn that into action. And you're right about a postcode lottery, but, but I also must say that there are some phenomenal local pieces of work. Like for example, in my community, the Wandsworth Community Empowerment Network are doing fantastic work in the space of black Muslim mental health and creating you know, dialogue there. And um, it would be fantastic if you know, some of the small organizations all around the country had people that they could work with who had more funding, who had more sort of stake in the community, um, that, that actually um, you know, some of these smaller initiatives could be, could be grown as well to, you know, to target um, you know, you know, some of the, like, the intersectional issues uh, that were, you know, touched on, like, what does it mean to be gay and be Muslim? You know, those, those bring themselves a um, whole, whole raft of issues. What does it mean to be gay, black and Muslim? What does it mean to be female and a revert? Uh, these are all things that there are some, there are some smaller organizations who are doing fantastic work in those spaces, you know, spaces and it's how do we amplify their voices? I just wondered, uh, Shanaz, as the author of the report, did you have any reflections on, on the comments and the questions? So, um, I mean, to pick up a little bit where Ghazala left off uh, in terms of um, co-production of interventions and sharing power. I mean, I would say from community perspectives that um, reflections over the past would suggest that often that relationship is a unidirectional one um, and that Muslim-led organizations or Muslim community organizations that really are at the heart of grassroots communities and that are doing a lot of this on a voluntary basis or on uh, shoestring budgets are often mined for their expertise, but that, that expertise is then taken away and they, they have no ownership 
over what, what occurs with the, the work that they transfer into more established organizations. So I think it's really important to break those cycles of exploitation. Um, it's important to share power. It's important to give back leadership responsibilities to those who actually are connected to their communities and, and have been doing this work in an undervalued and unrecognized way for so very long. Brilliant, thank you, thank you very much. Um, Brian, I can see you've got your hand raised, but I was actually going to come to you and Vanessa um, for the next question. So maybe you could you can address it in that as well when I come to you next. So I wanted to ask Brian and Vanessa, what, what models of partnership working and best practice have we seen work well that we can draw on? Brian, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, I, I'll attempt to fold in the point I was going to make. Um, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I completely agree with um, both what Shinaz and Gisela said there. And I just, I get, if I can do a slightly um, off the wall, um, slightly amusing ex experience that stuck with me um, to, to answer your point. I used to work for the School Food Trust, which um, people might remember was set up after Jimmy Oliver school dinner program. And so the kind of aim of that was to make sure that more children were eating healthy school meals. And I went to this particular school and they were completely bemused because um, their way to reward children who were switching over to uh, eat school meals rather than unhealthy packed lunches was to place the children on the top table. And they couldn't understand why as a result of this brilliant initiative that some enterprising person had uh, come up with, the number of children starting to eat school meals started to decline. And of course, it was a classic example of designing something in your own image because the children were supposed to be being rewarded but actually saw it as a punishment because they would have been taken away from the friendship groups, put on the table with other kids that they didn't know and, and so on. Um, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a complete disincentive. And, and I guess um, the reason I bring up that slightly left field uh, example is because I think um, that point about co-production uh, is you have to go slower. It takes more time. And there's, there's an inherent tension, I think, in the system that, you know, we're going through a period of transformation, both in terms of the way the system is designed, kind of integration of health and social care, but also the money that's coming down to help transform the system. So that's a, that's a good thing, but that means leaders at the top of the health system are trying to see change driven. But when you're starting from such a kind of low base, I think it's incredibly important that you bring people with you. So I just think um, the, the work that, you know, um, Vanessa talked about the work that Mind are doing some of the work that Catherine's doing through Place to Be and the work that we're doing um, in Somerset and East London and so on does require a much more painstaking, uh, genuinely collaborative approach, which means that you will probably find you're doing things completely differently. It also means, and again, I'll say this in the spirit of being collegiate, that some of the big organisations giving up some of their power, possibly saying goodbye to some of the services that they've run, um, and I completely agree with Vanessa that making sure that the kind of financial component, which is so important for organisations that are often living hand-to-mouth existence, you can't do that. You can't really support your community if you're worrying about where your next grant's coming from in three weeks' time. So I think a completely different approach to, to partnership is at the centre of all of this. Lovely. Thank you, Brian. Vanessa, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, very much agree with that. I mean, I think I would highlight some fantastic examples and pockets of really good collaborative and practice and, and generous leadership. But I think that bringing this together as a web is what is most important and making sure that there is safe and protected space for all of the practitioners who have done a huge amount of work on complete string and in a very unbenign environment. The thing, the projects I would really highlight and kind of give me hope, I you know I do think very much about the high end project and the sheer range of the different things that that's been able to do across the years, both for younger people and for older Somali people within the community. I think as well with, with optimism about the um, transforming community mental health program and the role of the voluntary sector within that that Brian's referring to as well. Um, we have community connectors who come from different faith and cultural communities. I know that there's other people here, for example, hello. Abdi, um, who is a community connector in Tower Hamlets, that the idea that you sort of, you, the, the NHS 
kind of seed funds and supports the ability of grassroots organizations to do flexible working that responds to, but also builds an evidence base around need. Um, I think linking in and creating clear pathways there that takes into account a lot of the really good work that people like Inspirited Minds have done around anti-stigma work where you can effectively, you've got a toolkit, but then help, that, help create pathways through to existing services, I think is extremely important as well. I also think it's really important within those partnerships um, is also to link in the academic side and the kind of therapeutic development side. We're becoming much more aware of the role that minority stress plays. And I think we've, various speakers across the day have spoken about the importance of tailoring therapeutic interventions. We need to make sure that we've got a really good approach to platforming and really taking the time, which may be many years, to develop therapeutic approaches that explicitly address particular forms of minority stress. Thank you so much so much to unpick here isn't there <laughs> i'm sure we could actually have this conversation for three hours and still have more to talk about um look as a doctor i agree with the 61 percent of respondents who said that it's important that mental health services display cultural and faith sensitivity indeed faith is a protective characteristic and sensitivity is really vital across all professional sectors to ensure that young people feel heard and um, understood uh, when seeking help and support. Therefore, I was wondering, Catherine, would you be able to sort of jump in here and, and say how you think we can bridge the gap and create support, um, you know, sort of like create and support faith and culturally competent workforces? I know you touched on it earlier, if you'd like to just elaborate a little bit. So I think there, there are two areas. One is recognizing that uh, the current workforce may not necessarily represent the communities that we work with directly in terms of young people. So I think there's a need for um, mental health professionals to build a greater understanding of the impact of different cultures, um, different faith and learn from those who are equipped and skilled and, and from particular faith-based backgrounds who bring that sensitivity. So we need to, you know, this event in itself, putting some spotlight on this, we need to have more space and dialogue around this. And then in the training of mental health professionals to bring that in. You mentioned, Rosanna, what does it mean to be to be, uh, to be gay, to be black, to be Muslim, um, all of those different aspects combined and and what that means to then access support and so for a therapist to be able to work with the client and understand the complexity and unpick those issues and I know these are some of the challenges and the stigma that that brings um, uh, I talked to one of one of our team who talked about a case in one of the schools where a child who who is Muslim uh, is trans and is actually dealing with that couldn't speak to anybody else and this was the first time that they had actually expressed questions around their own sexuality this is not something that they can speak about at home it's not something that they can speak with their parents so how do you start to unpick that and work with a, with a child who is then within the school system so i think all uh, mental health professionals counselors therapists need to build an understanding of some of the complexity and then there is a piece which is about how do we bring people from, how do we expand the workforce for people from a greater range of cultures, ethnicities and different faith and encourage more people into the mental health workspace? Because this is not something that's, that is going away easily. It's something we've, mental health is so much more on the agenda and, but we know that we don't have enough skilled professionals um, to be able to meet the need that is out there. Um, so I think I think we have to address it at, at two levels. Thank you. The time has flown, my friends, um, and we're on to the final part um, of the proceedings today, where we're going to take a couple of questions uh, from the audience and see how many we can get through in the next uh, um, 10 minutes. The first question I have is from Shardim Hussain. Thank you very much, uh, Shardim. Um, research has long shown that corporate training on diversity and sensitivity doesn't work. Many organizations do this as a tick box exercise. So how can we work together to change this and to actually measure 
change? What an interesting and honest question. Um, who would like to give that a go? Vanessa, and I'll, I'll come to Vanessa and then, and then to Dr. Mir. I think when anything happens in a silo, then it's very hard for it to work and for it to stick. Um, so it's extremely important that whatever kind of training also both includes cultural humility from individual practitioners, but also cultural humility from institutions. So making sure that we're making the best of um, accountability by through things like ensuring um, workforce race equality standards are kind of publicly discussed and we kind of having collective discussions about um, how the difference of experience of practitioners. Um, I think we also need to make sure that we are um, I'm thinking about training, etc. So I've lost my train of thought. Don't worry, it happens to me on a regular. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Yeah, Dr. Mir. Yeah, well, just to say, I think on training, I think it is, it is really important uh, what kind of training is given and the context in which training is given. So I think if you just, uh, as many policy documents say, you know, it's really important to be culturally sensitive. That means so many different things to so many different people. And it actually people need to know the form and content of what interventions would actually help. They need to have specific support. I mean, when we were developing the approach that we developed, people even wanted to be told the words in which to hand over the self-help book that they felt so unconfident about engaging with this, with this, you know, this, this new uh, sort of type of identity that they hadn't had any training in. They even wanted to be given script on how to actually uh, introduce themselves as, as somebody who was or wasn't from the, you know, a shared background. And um, so I think the form and content of, of what is being developed needs to be specified for people. It needs to be evidence-based. And then the training needs to be um, done in a way that, you know, addresses the whole spectrum of what people might understand by cultural sensitivity. So for example, whether or not to introduce faith or engage with faith identity, when we looked at this from speaking to lots of different people um, in, in our research, it ranged from people saying, no, no, it's unprofessional to, to talk about faith at all in a, in a clinical setting, to people saying, no, we have to actually, or people were saying, you know, if the, if the client raises it, then we will raise it. But the client's often waiting for the professional to take the lead on this, uh, of what you can and can't talk about. And then, and then on the other end, in terms of good practice that we identified, is people actually making a space to say, is this important to you, in a way that's not actually um, uh, putting pressure on people. Because to say to a Muslim, is religion important to you? It's actually quite difficult for them to say no. It can be quite difficult. So actually raising this, we, we came up with a tool that would help people to say what was important to them in their lives, uh, a values assessment tool. So actually training needs to be quite specific in terms of you know how to in, how to actually be culturally sensitive i don't think it's enough to just put out these sort of aspirations that people may interpret in lots of different ways and just on the point of specialist training that you mentioned catherine i think we need to go beyond the idea of training people for years there are some approaches behavioral activation has been shown to be just as effective as cbt on, a, on the basis of a five-day training program so we need to make use of all these community organizations that we've got in Bradford what we're doing at the moment is actually training people from those organizations to deliver culturally adapted BA and I think that is really what we need to look at rather than trying to work with a very small and difficult to get into profession of trained therapists we need to actually expand where therapy is available and make it easy to access. Yeah, fascinating. It, it's it's very, very frustrating um, when you are from any sort of minority background, when you know that anything that is happening in your workspace is just simply done as a tick box exercise and people are very proud of themselves, you know, selves for it and patting themselves on the back. Um, and, you know, especially like me, you know, when you are mixed race and, you know, it, it, is, it, it is really interesting because sometimes you feel that you don't quite fall into any box. And sometimes you would just like somebody to just you know, address you as a person and ask you, what are your needs exactly, you know, like you've said, Dr. Mir. And I think I think we forget that sometimes because sometimes it's so easy as well to sort of put our prejudices onto people and say, well, you know, she's she's a woman and she's black and she's a Muslim. I think she's going to find this the hardest in her life or that the hardest in her life. Why don't we just ask people what it is that they need and then tailor approaches to see what they are telling us their needs are? Thank you. Um, I've got another question from Susie Miller. Thank you, Susie. She says, it is clear that faith, in addition to race, culture and class, are factors 
which are essential to mental health well-being. How are we going to make sure that this is taken up at strategic and practice levels in a responsive yet systematic way? Man Somali Mental Health Sheffield do much of our community health literacy work in mosques. Gathering data by faith and ethnicity is important. Brilliant, who wants to tackle that? Well, maybe actually I'll come to Shanaz uh, first, if, if, if that's okay, given the fact that you've written the report and you've probably come across a lot of these issues. Thank you. Um, so, um, I mean, it's a really interesting question given our current landscape. Um, and, and I think panelists and participants certainly will be familiar with some of the ways in which policymaking has engaged with faith in recent years. I mean, it's really fall, fallen off the equality agenda in many respects. It's almost seen um, as a marginal concern um, in relation to some of the other protected characteristics. Um, and it's, it's disappointing, I would say, certainly. Uh, but when it comes to, to mental health in particular, I think this conversation is somewhat disjointed because mental health is certainly something that's high up on our policy agenda, but faith, race, and social class seem to seem to be lagging behind. And I think coming back to this, um, to where it is that we place emphasis on how we want services to improve in the future, it is a, a policy commitment that work in this area should be person centric. That we put the person that is accessing services, the person that is seeking help, the person that presents themselves is in need of assistance at the heart of how we start assembling tools to enable them to um, improve in their mental well-being. Um, and the person-centric approach requires that we listen to them. Uh, data capture is a really valuable tool in that respect, but cap capturing data is not sufficient if it doesn't then get integrated into, into policy design and policy implementation. Brilliant. Would anybody else like to like to come in on that on that point, or I can move on to another question? Oh yes, yes, Dr. Mir, and then Catherine. Yeah, just a quick point that I think um, national bodies like IAP have a huge role to play. Um, they could be actually promoting the kind of approaches that we've been talking about today nationally, and I think they really resist. For some reason, there's a resistance to that. It's you know I have tried engaging with with national IAP, and, and I know Touchstone in Leeds, which has adopted the approach and other IAPT um, services that have adopted it have not got that national kind of support. So I think we need to be pushing at the national bodies to make this kind of more consistent across the country. And just to say that I think in terms of um, the public approach to faith, it's not just marginal, it's actually a negative identity in terms of Muslim faith, that it's uh, targeted in a negative way by policy. And um, so in terms of mental health um, services and prevent, for example, there's a, a recent development that is really quite horrifying, which is that um, mental health services will actually be expected to report to prevent people from Muslim backgrounds who, uh, you know, who, who are um, using those services if there's any sort of uh, indication that, that they might be a risk in any way. So, so that is actually going to stop people from using the services. And it's also in the, in the context of institutional racism that we know exists, it means that many people will be referred that should not be referred and that will actually be uh, face, face harassment and, and really uh, traumatic experiences as a result of trying to get support. So, so that sort of public um, approach needs to be really undermined and challenged and we need to really have much more positive, uh, positive and legitimate um, sort of uh, ideas about what faith is from, in Muslim communities. Because at a personal level, it's a huge resource for people. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, Catherine? Um, I think there's also something about uh, mental health support being normalizing it and talking about it generally so within communities. So I think there was a question in the chat about what role um, the mo we can play with or the mosques can play. And when I think of the school environment, we know that children um, from any background will access when something is normalized within an environment. So actually having more dialogue, and whether that is for parents to talk more about mental health with their children and young people, how, we need to get it uh, just more normalized within with all sectors of the community, as well as then having more specialists. We know mental health is an area that needs investment and needs focus on the promoting the positive mental health as well as the addressing mental health issues, the more in-depth piece. And I think if 
if we there's a there's a really important role for um, leaders within the local community to talk positively about mental health. So again, we start to remove more stigma about it. So I don't know what what role um, local leaders can play within that. Mm. I think they certainly can can play a huge role. And I know that locally in Tooting, we have a phenomenally engaged local Muslim community who are doing phenomenal work. You know, they really, really recognize what the needs of the community are. And we have a very, very engaged um, mosque uh, community who are working together with local partnerships uh, to do, you know, to do very good work. And I think we also have a duty to highlight good practice when we see it as well so that other people can see what happens and goes hold on maybe we can emulate that as well um one last quick question i probably only have time to come to one person um to answer this but i wanted to get this one in because i think it's really important and goes to the nub of a lot of issues how can parents families and the wider muslim community ensure that their young people have the support they need to maintain positive mental health and well-being as well as break down some of the stigma surrounding mental health issues within the Muslim community? This is a million dollar question for me. Um, would anybody like to, uh, to respond to that? How do we engage the families? Shanaz, I see you unmuted. So, yeah, so I, want to say, I want to say a few things because this was something that couldn't be explored in more detail in the report. Um, because the number of people who said that they turned to families or turned to mosques was quite small. Most people were more likely to say that they would turn to friends or peer groups um, for support. Um, but I, I think families and communities actually do have a really valuable role to play because these are places in which young people are socialized in their faith. This is where they learn some of those tools that then come to be so important to them when they're navigating their difficulties individually, no matter where they turn, whether it is to, to their friends or, or, or accessing mainstream services or voluntary services or other. Um, I think mental health literacy in families and communities is a really important tool. Um, I think families need to know more about um, what, it, what it means to engage with a young person who brings up a, a conversation around I don't feel particularly good or you know I am struggling with x y or z um, and how it is that, that, that young people's feelings are not diminished that they're not made to feel uh, guilt or they're not made to feel that this is something that will pass that you know tomorrow you'll wake up it will be another day that sort of attitude I think that's really important and I think mental health literacy is the only way that some of that can be tackled meaningfully um, I think for um, in relation to communities, I mean, Rosanna, you mentioned Tooting Mosque, um, and I, I know some of that amazing work that they do down there in South London. Um, and I think there are other mosques in the country that are also trying really hard to integrate mental health into some of the services that they provide to their local communities. But they're often doing this on budgets that don't exist. Yes. They're doing it out of a mosque yes. budget that itself is, is you know, stretched not least because of covid and then because fundraising over the last 18 months has collapsed for many of our mosques um, and then they're having to do it in ways in which when they go to when they try or attempt uh, collaboration with other partners that they become a lesser partner in that in that rubric um, and I think I think for for services and commissioning services in particular to recognize that these assets and communities are assets. They are places that people turn. They are places that can be utilized. They're not, I mean, not just in the physical sense that, you know, these are locations where people can be gathered, but these are places where people learn religion. This is where people come into contact with religion. This is where people are, are talking to other people in religion um, and utilizing that myriad of um, support methods um, and integrating that into ways in which you go about looking at supporting young people through mainstream and voluntary services. I think mosques should be a fundamental part of what collaboration and co-production looks like in the future. Brilliant, thank you very, very much. Well, we have come to the end of this fantastic session and I would really like to thank all of the speakers who've given up their time to join us here today to mark the launch of this report, which I'm so excited to say is now live. It can be seen and accessed on 
bcbn.org.uk forward slash reports. And I think one of the things that I'm really heartened by is the number of phenomenal participants as well who've attended today. Thank you for all that you do within your communities. Um, the 17 recommendations made in this report underline the key steps we need to take to ensure that young Muslims struggling with their mental health are not hidden survivors, but supported service users. And as we move out of the pandemic, it's vital that we put children and young people's mental health at the heart of our policy making. We cannot afford to let down a generation. And I feel very enthusiastic about moving forward with this report when I look at the commitment from our panelists and all those participating today I know that together we can come together and support the Muslim community and give our young people the opportunity to fulfill the potential that we know they can with their lives and so thank you so much for everyone being here today it has just been wonderful to share this event with you thank you so much to BCBN again for all of your work and for allowing me to be part of this thank you very much and I hope you go on to have a wonderful rest of the day thank you